In the late 30s, the highly organized teams of Hitler Germany, dedicated to national prestige, dominated the Grand Prix circuits of the world. German cars and the circuits of Europe are silent. Two days ago, Hitler invaded Belgium and Holland. But in North Africa, on Marshal Balbo's monumental circuit, the Italians hold their last Tripoli Grand Prix. This circuit was built in the early 30s to demonstrate to the world the speed and control of Italian cars and racing drivers. But in the face of German domination, Italy limited her own Grand Prix races to smaller one and a half litre cars. Her little Alfa Romeos and Maseratis of today are to set the pace of post-war racing. The winning car is a 158 Alfa Romeo. The driver, Dr. Giuseppe Farina. The Americans are the only people still racing by the end of 1940. Grand Prix racing, with its focus in Europe, hasn't caught on in the States, and it's left to keen amateurs to run a last road race at the World's Fair in New York. Again, the winning card is an Italian Alfa Romeo. The war has entered its second year, but these are the garages of Indianapolis on the morning of the last 500-mile race. The oval track with its banked turns puts all the emphasis on sheer speed, but the advantages of good road holding are clear. Twice running, Wilbur Shaw has won on his Italian Maserati, and he's heading for a third win when a wheel goes. Marty Rose, the little guy with the big moustache wins the last 500. An epoch is over, but Rose is one who will be ready to drive again as motor racing struggles to be reborn. Italy will still have two of the greatest professional drivers of the 20s, Nuvolari and Vazzi, besides her latest champions, Farina of Alfa Romeo and Luigi Villaresi of Maserati. Britain will start with only a handful of amateurs driving their own cars, like Red Parnell and Prince Bira. France will have her own champion, the wealthy amateur Raymond Sommer, besides Louis Chiron, the three times winner of the French Grand Prix, and Jean-Pierre Vemille, the one driver left in the Bugatti works team. Professional German drivers, like Caracciola and Lang, will have no teams to go back to for years to come. The war is hardly over before the French start racing. It's a matter of getting any possible car. The circuit is a makeshift right on the edge of Paris on the roads of the Bois de Boulogne. There's little enough fuel and tires for essential services. But after all, Paris is where motor racing was born. The crowd thrilled to see their own Jean-Pierre Vimille winning again at the wheel of the very last of the racing Bugattis. A tourist attraction of the Côte d'Azur in the 30s was Grand Prix racing in the streets. And there's a team of one and a half litre Maseratis from Italy when the Nice Grand Prix is revived. This short, twisting circuit is ideal for the Italian cars. Chiron also does well with his rare Grand Prix version of a Talbo. But the others have to work hard with their big, stripped sports cars. 
It's been a triumph of diplomacy to get an Italian team across the frontier so soon after the war. Although Villaresi, like everyone else, is out of practice. His Maserati's winning speed is only slightly slower than the pre-war record. There's plenty to celebrate, and even the champagne goes wild. On the same April day in Britain, treasured cars are brought out into the spring sunshine. During the war, enthusiasm for motor racing has been growing as never before, and a Grand Prix in Hyde Park is the hopeful dream. Unfortunately, the law forbids the use of public roads for racing, and now Brooklands and all the other circuits have been closed. Reality is part of the runway of a borrowed aerodrome at Elstree. A real race is impossible, but a hundred entries have been received just to drive against the clock for a quarter of a mile. No one is discouraged, and these few enthusiasts of the Vintage Sports Car Club are the forerunners of thousands competing in British club meetings nearly every summer weekend. Motor racing enthusiasm is spreading worldwide. A record crowd comes to the 1946 Indianapolis 500. Like all circuits, it has suffered from neglect during the war. But speedway history is made when the lap record is broken by a new, independently sprung car, a Novi Governor. But it, and many of the old warriors, don't last the distance. Towards the finish, only eight cars are actually running. The winning Thorn Special has old-fashioned springing, but its driver, George Robson, has averaged over 114 for the 500 miles. The racing fever mounts when the works Maseratis come as far as Paris. Scuderia Milan have signed up Sommer as well as the great Nouvellare. Alongside the one and a half litre Maseratis is a big Alpha with Vermeil. Nouvellare retires, but there's real racing between Sommer on the little Maserati and Vermeil on the big Alpha. Unfortunately, Sommer, the lion-hearted, is too enthusiastic. The other Maserati drivers just aren't in the same class. Vermeil is left on his own, winning not only the race, but also an invitation to drive an Alfa Romeo in the works team. The 158 Alfa Romeo, winner at Tripoli, is the most advanced one and a half litre racing car in the world, with its supercharged straight eight engine and independent suspension all round. Two Alphas make their first post-war appearance in the Paris suburb of saint Cloud. Broad-nosed Alphas lead, but Sommer delights in getting his Maserati up with Vermeil. Both Alphas disappear with transmission trouble, and no one is more surprised than Sommer to find he has defeated the fastest one and a half litre cars in the world. When the Swiss run a Grand Prix at Geneva, motor racing is becoming more organised for there's a newly formed international controlling body, the FIA. But the official starter is still ignored. The Alphas so clearly outclass all other cars that the race becomes a procession. The Italian champion, Farina, is in front, and their new French driver, Vimil, has to be content to follow behind. Alphas are first, second and third when Farina wins. 
The Italians are as short of money as anyone, but they get enough to run a race by combining it with a lottery and holding it in a municipal park in Turin. Alpha are in strength with Vermeil, Farina, Trossi and the legendary Vazzi. Nuvolari is driving one of the Scuderia Milan Maseratis together with Samer. Reg Parnell and several others have been invited from Britain with their ERAs. Farina is among those trying to jump the start. Nuvolari loses a wheel and another race becomes an Alfa Romeo procession. In the leading Alfa is Vazzi, back on form right down to his traditional cigarette. An obedient, if frustrated, Vermeil is half a second behind the winning Vazzi. The Italian Alphas, with their four-leaf clovers, are unbeatable. By 1947, even in the coldest climates, men and women happily sacrifice comfort for a chance to watch this increasingly popular sport. The Swedes run one of their own special Grand Prix races on a frozen lake and invite French and British drivers. Next year, the FIA will be enforcing a formula which will limit Grand Prix racing to cars like these with blown engines of up to one and a half litres or with unblown engines of up to four and a half litres. The drivers are less easy to distinguish, but they include Samer and Chiron. The new formula will still leave plenty of scope for racing and developing these cars. But the point of such official control is to discourage brute force and channel technical development along useful lines. Red Parnell wins on his 13-year-old British car, the first ERA ever built. Without the formula, and with little money for new designs, the first racing cars to appear are stopgaps. Gordini's Simcas have ordinary Fiat 1100 engines. This Simca is in Brazil for the Grand Prix at Rio de Janeiro. impressive demonstration of French engineering to the rich markets of America when the little Simca shows how good road holding can make up for a lack of engine power. A group of Italians are working along similar lines to Gordini and arrive with 22 new Cisitalias for a race near Cairo. Cisitalias are also based on Fiat parts and dozens have been made. a delight to drive, but not powerful enough to be spectacular, and the public don't pay to see them. Neither Cisitalia's nor Gordini's are ever a real commercial success. All the same, Nuvolari, in spite of failing health, gives the Cisitalia project his full support, and is to drive a new sports car version in the 1947 Mille Miglia and the government is releasing the 20,000 gallons of fuel needed to run this famous thousand-mile race over the main roads of Italy. Nuvolari is now a very sick man, but takes the lead in his tiny open car from Biondetti's saloon. At Bologna, Nuvolari leads by nine minutes. Sun alternates with rain. Then, only 80 miles from the finish, the Cisitalia's magneto is swamped, and Nuvolari loses the critical quarter of an hour. He arrives at the finish in a state of collapse, only to find that he has lost first place by 10 minutes to Biondetti in a 2.9 alpha. The Belgian Grand Prix at Spa has been selected as the European Grand Prix of the year by the FIA 
and although there's still no limit on engine size, it's run to the regulation distance of around 300 miles. Even without an engine limit, there's no real competition for the 158 Alphas. The meal laps at nearly 102 to take the lead. He is arriving at the top. Bartzi is second, but it is the last we shall see of this great driver. It is left to John Cobb, a London stockbroker, to uphold British pride when he takes the world land speed record up to 394 and becomes the first man ever to exceed 400 miles an hour on land. This astonishing record is to stand for 16 years. Asked what it felt like, Cobb described it simply as bloody quick. In 1948, motor racing is back in all its splendor. The French Grand Prix is once again at Reims, and the one and a half litre formula is now in force. The race becomes another Alfa Romeo procession, with Lago Talbo and Maseratis bringing up the rear. The meal is averaging around 102 miles an hour, and there's no Vazzi to challenge him. A few weeks ago, Vazzi was killed trying out a new car. The meal on the 158 Alpha has established his position as the fastest driver of his day. Nuvolari hasn't given up. For the 1948 Mille Emilia, he and Biondetti have new cars. Enzo Ferrari, who ran the Alpha team before the war, is building his own cars. Again, Nuvolari leads. This time, his Ferrari has been so damaged that any ordinary man would have given up. But Nuvolari races on with more and more bits falling off. Nuvolari's last Mille Emilia is never finished. But new blood is on the way. The Sports Car Club of America held its first race in 1947. And by the end of the 40s, there are meetings at Bridgehampton, Watkins Glen, Palm Springs, and Sebring. It is all essentially amateur. But Tom Cole is one who will make his name in Europe. John Fitch is another. Holland is the latest country to go motor racing. It's all so new to them that they've asked the British Racing Drivers Club to run their meeting. The Zandvoort circuit is on roads that were part of the wartime fortifications on the sand dunes near Harlem. A day's good sport comes to a finish when Bira wins by yards on his Maserati. Late in 1948, the Royal Automobile Club of Great Britain gets the use of an aerodrome at Silverstone and decides to run its own Grand Prix. Apart from the many pre-war cars, there's a new one and a half litre Maserati. It still has the old four-cylinder supercharged engine, but the chassis is tubular and it has a more streamlined body. Wide open spaces of an aerodrome don't make an ideal road circuit. But gangs of enthusiasts have spent days putting down hundreds of straw bales to make artificial corners. No one is seriously hurt, and the new Maseratis are out in front. 
Maserati's up-and-coming driver, Alberto Ascari, is on 11. Villaresi now leads on 18. The British ERAs are called, unkindly, Early English Perpendicular. But Gerard's is as fast as a Maserati. Villaresi leads Ascari in by 14 seconds, with an ERA close behind. Britain's first Grand Prix for many years is an overwhelming success. There's a second circuit at Goodwood in West Sussex, which has some of the old Brooklyn's atmosphere. Red Parnell has just bought one of the new Maseratis, regretting that there's still no British car to replace the ERAs. There is, however, a tiny factory at Surbiton on the outskirts of London, building modest racing cars on a commercial basis. John Cooper, in the centre, uses simple 500cc motorbike engines, but has the advanced idea of independent suspension all round. How do you keep the motor cool in the back there? Oh, you can see that better over here. Cooper and his father began by building cars for their own fun, but they now have many customers, including that greatest of all enthusiasts, Raymond Sommer. <laughs> a wistful Nuvolari takes a keen interest. Racing 500cc cars began in England as a cheap form of amateur sport, but as it grows in popularity, Coopers increasingly dominate the class. Drivers and constructors get valuable experience as they learn things the hard way. The Coopers, with their rear engines on light chassis, are the shape of things to come. And more and more often, the leading Cooper is driven by a young man in a white crash helmet who somehow goes faster than anyone else. He is not yet 20, and his name is Sterling Moss. Another newcomer makes its debut in 1948, the Grand Prix Ferrari. It is short, squat and ugly. But behind the grille is a V12 engine that is technically well in advance of the Alpha Straight 8. The Italian Grand Prix in Turin is to be the tryout of the new Ferrari. But again, Vermeil in his Alpha leads from start to finish. Sommer on 28 finds the short Ferrari tricky to handle and never seriously challenges Vermeil. On the 17th of October 1948, the famous Italian circuit at Monza near Milan is reopened with new grandstands and facilities for the 100,000 spectators needed to make any major race financially sound. Famous drivers of the past are guests of honor. Many pre-war champions are still driving, but it is Jean-Pierre Vemille who is now the accepted master. Farina has left Alfa to try his luck with the new Ferrari. Villaresi remains faithful to Maserati, together with his own pupil and protege, Alberto Ascari. Alfa Romeo and Maserati have met the challenge of the new formula by developing their pre-war one and a half liter blown engines. Both parts of the formula are well justified for the less heavily stressed and more economical Lago Talbo with their four and a half litre unblown engines have also several Grand Prix wins. Motor racing is finally back in all its pre-war glory, both as a spectacle and as a contest between the most skilled and courageous drivers of many nations, backed up by the finest engineers and mechanics. For three critical hours, the results of years of research and patient development 
are put to the test in the hands of a few picked men. Once again, Italy has a circuit where she can show the world the speed and control of the latest Italian racing cars. Vermeil leads the field. The winner of those first races in Paris has gone from victory to victory and is now at the height of his fame. Every racing driver, however, must face the fact that each race may be his last and Vermeil is to lose his life before the winter is over. Motor racing has always had its tragedy, its triumph and even its comedy. Jean-Pierre Vermeil has driven his last race, but motor racing itself is now triumphantly reborn.